Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose people we are. I greet you uh, on this fifth Sunday in the season of Easter, and also Mother's Day. A happy Mother's Day to all of you who are tuning in uh, on this Mother's Day. Um, we, uh, we, th we give thanks to God for uh, all the loving uh, mothers in our lives, and we, uh, we pray God's blessing upon them. I have several announcements to share with you in the life of our congregation. The first is that Sunday Night Live uh, is going to start up again on Sunday, May 17th. That's next Sunday. We will be joining together, not physically, but virtually via the Zoom platform. And we'll be meeting via Zoom, virtually, at our regular 5.30 p.m. time. Uh, there will, of course, be no dinner, but we will enjoy one another's company. An invitation to the Sunday Night Live Zoom gathering will be sent out by email this coming Saturday. Please look for it. Then on Sunday at 5.30, or a few minutes before, join the gathering by simply clicking on the link provided in the meeting invitation that has been emailed to you. In our opening virtual gathering, we will share our thoughts and feelings about what we've been going through during this time of the coronavirus. A second new development is that beginning this Wednesday, Wednesday, May 13th, at 7.30 p.m. in the evening, and every Wednesday evening thereafter indefinitely, we will join together again via Zoom virtually in a series of, in a service of Wednesday evening prayer, traditionally called Vespers. An invitation will be sent out again by email each week in advance of the service. For those of you for whom we have emails. Wednesday evening prayer will include the lighting of candles, scripture readings, virtual hymn singing, which we can do uh, on Zoom, and meditations, and of course, times for prayer. We uh, hope that you will want to join in, and if you do, then again at 7.30, or just a few minutes beforehand, Simply click on the link provided in the invitation that has been emailed to you, and you will be ushered into the virtual service. On Tuesday, May 22nd, it is my hope that our Table Talk book discussion group will resume uh, virtually for those of, those of you who can do so. We will meet at our regular Tuesday morning time at 11 a.m. and we'll be picking up where we left off with the book, The Return of the Noticer, or The Noticer Returns by Andy Andrews. And uh, we'll be connecting with each other about what we want to uh, see happen next in that book discussion's uh, life together. The food pantry, as you probably know by now, is up and running again uh, in the month of May, and it will be open two days per week, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, from 12 noon to 3 p.m. Uh, we do want to thank all of you who gave so generously this past week to the pantry. Many cans and goods were collected, and uh, that is wonderful, so thank, thank you for that. As always, our prayer requests... Um, uh, can be called into the church office or passed along to Eunice Lester. And your financial support continues to be very important and is indeed much appreciated. At the back of your bulletin this morning, and for those of you who use the bulletin in conjunction with the visual and audio uh, recording of this service, uh, at the back of your bulletin this morning is a note from myself as your pastor. You may want to read that, and it shares my, my thoughts and feelings about all of you as a congregation. So let us now 
open in our time of worship together in a call to worship that I have chosen from the 95th Psalm. Here are these familiar words. The Lord is God, the mighty God. He holds in his hand the depths of the earth and the highest mountains as well. He made the sea, it belongs to him. The dry land too, for it was formed by his hands. Come then, let us bow down and worship, bending the knee before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are his people, the flock he shepherds. Would you join me in prayer? O oh Lord God, creator of the earth and indeed the cosmos, we bow down and worship before you because there is no one but you who is worthy of worship. O oh God, bless us in this time together. Bless us as we tune in from our virtual places of worship. Speak to our hearts this day and encourage us in the walk of faith. We thank you for who you have been to us down through the ages and who you will be to your people always. We pray this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us as his people, his disciples, to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, if you're like me, you know your strengths and you know your weaknesses. You know where you have succeeded and you know where you have failed. You know what is inherently good in you and you also know those places where you miss the mark. We are called each week as people of God to admit our failings, our our brokenness, our sin, and to ask for the forgiveness of our loving God, who graciously wills to make us whole, make us strong, and cleanse us from all that is not right within us. So let us now take a moment in silence, come before our God in prayer, and humbly and in faith, confess our sins, our brokenness before the Lord, knowing that he is all too willing to redeem, to restore, and to reclaim. Let us pray. In Christ's name, we pray. Friends, Scripture tells us that Christ went to the cross for us that we might be cleansed of all our unrighteousness and be washed clean and made whole as his people. Believe the good news of the gospel 
In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Friends, our gospel reading this fifth Sunday in the season of Easter is from John's gospel, from the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 7. Listen now for the word of God to you and to the church. Jesus is speaking and he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also." And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, from whom we come, unto whom we return, and in whom we live and move and have our being, Welcome us into your house of scripture, that we may be nourished with your word and sheltered by your truth. And by your spirit, lead us forth in hope and in faith. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Who among us does not know and has not felt at some time the emotional tug of the refrain of Simon and Garfunkel's song, Homeward Bound? Homeward Bound, I wish I was homeward bound. Home where my thoughts escape and hope, home where my music's playing, Home where my love lies waiting silently for me. There are, of course, many hymns that include the word home in at least one of their verses. The third verse of Amazing Grace, for instance. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home There's that sweet old gospel number, softly and tenderly, goes like this. Patiently, Jesus is waiting and watching, waiting and watching for you and for me. And then that lilting chorus, come home, come home, come home. And that 19th century spiritual, going home, Going home, I'm just going home. It's not far, just close by. Through an open door, I'm just going home. Or the evocative Isaac Watts palm paraphrase of Psalm 23 that served as our invitation to Holy Communion last Sunday. The last verse always does me in. Oh, may your house be my abode and all my work be praise. There would I find a settled rest while others go and come, no more a stranger or a guest, but like a child at home. Few words pull at the human heart like the word 
home. A friend of mine, Doug King, penned an essay years ago in which he wrote this. What a luxury it is to be invited into where you are known and people prepare for your arrival. I think of college freshmen coming home after their first semester away or when good friends make a journey to spend time together. A room is prepared, freshly laundered sheets on the bed, flowers in a vase by the window, a fire roars in the fireplace, at the door, a welcoming hug. The burden of your bags taken from your hands, you are escorted to the most comfortable seat in the house and offered your favorite drink. Before long, old jokes are being shared and the room is filled with laughter. Then Doug asked this rhetorical question, is this what awaits each of us? In the passage we just read and heard from the Gospel of John, Jesus says that the answer to that question is yes. On this, the last night of his life, Jesus says to his anxious disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you. One of the disciples, Thomas, asks how they might find the way to this place, this home. Jesus' familiar answer is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then a footnote to that answer that many people find troubling no one comes to the Father except through me. We hear those words and imagine that Jesus is saying that Christianity is the only way to God, but comparative religion was not the topic of the evening. When these words were spoken, there was no Christianity yet. There wasn't a, this wasn't a philosophical discussion about religious exclusivity. The cross looms over the night. The air hangs heavy with it. These words are part of Jesus' struggle to make his disciples understand why there was no way around that cross. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And that way, that truth, that life are about to be made visible precisely in the cross. Jesus' sharp point is that there is no way to the Father except by the way before him, self-giving, obedience, trust, and love. He is telling his disciples that the deepest truth about the nature of God will be made visible in what is about to happen. And note that Jesus does not say there is no way to God except through me. His, he says that there is no way to the Father rather than no way to God. He's reminding his disciples and us that he's not speaking of God in some general or abstract sense. He's speaking of the parent like God with whom he has a filial relationship, a father-son relationship, the God he and we can trust in the way that children trust a parent who loves them fiercely. God, like a loving father who prepares their place for them or who welcomes the prodigal home. God, like a mother who welcomes her children home with outstretched arms. This passage is, of course, often read at funerals, but it should not be read only at funerals. In the context of a death, these words are about the many dwelling places of then and there, a heavenly home, if you will. Jesus is indeed making just such a promise a promise that indeed we take great comfort in, that gives us great assurance. But the promise is more than that. 
The promise implicit in these words is also a promise that he's preparing a place for those disciples and us, a place in the here and now, a home in this life, a place where they will find welcome and peace, acceptance and love. Remember, though this is the last night of his life, it's not the last night of theirs. The earthly home, Jesus pledges, will be in one another's company. This home will be in a community of welcome and grace, where they and you and I always have a place waiting for us. People often talk about their church home or their church family, and they do so for good reason. Some years back, Donna Tartt wrote a best-selling novel called The Goldfinch. It's a moving story. The protagonist in the story is a 13-year-old boy named Theo. When the story begins, Theo lives in Manhattan and goes to a private school. But by the end of chapter one, he's a 13-year-old without a home. He's an only child. His mother, with whom he lived and by whom he was passionately and well-loved, has died in an explosion at the Metropolitan Museum, of all places. His father is a drunk who has vanished years ago. Theo has nowhere to go. At first, the parents of a school chum take him in. They're a dysfunctional family of well-meaning Park Avenue blue bloods, aptly and ironically named the Barbours, spelled in the Brit way, oh. They provide a roof over his head, a very nice roof, and food to eat, very fine food, but they don't provide him a home. He's an obligatory house guest, treated politely and just as politely resented. Then, out of nowhere, Theo's alcoholic father shows up to take him to live with him and his latest bimbo girlfriend in the deserted desert exurbs of Las Vegas. Again, it's not a home, just a house, a new, huge, and empty one rented on the cheap during the housing crisis. His father has become a professional gambler. He took his son in partly, if not mostly, to get his hands on the modest estate the boy's mother left him. I'll spare you narrative detail. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't read the book and may. Suffice it to say that Theo escapes vacuous Las Vegas and runs back to New York not knowingly, not knowing precisely where in the big city he will go when he gets there, but he goes. He decides against the icy Park Avenue family that had grudgingly taken him in after his mother's death. And there's only one other option. A live-in antique shop in Greenwich Village presided over by a man he had met in the days after his mother's death. A man who shares his pain, perhaps the one person who knows the depth of Theo's pain. His name is Hobie, and he's a kind of Christ figure of sorts. Hobie is a carpenter. He restores antiques. That is to say, he makes old broken things like new. Hobie is self-giving. He serves the finest food, true and nourishing, and though not to Theo, the finest wine as well. But most importantly, Hobie shares Theo's pain. He has suffered what the child has suffered. Theo's early acquaintance with Hobie was bare, but the boy trusts him anyway, innately and wisely, so Theo heads down to the village on a bitter November night, hungry 
cold, and sick with something. Here's Tart's telling of the coming home moment. Theo is speaking. My heart sank. I stood on the street for a long moment or two before I worked up my nerve to ring the bell. It seemed that I stood for ages listening to the faraway echo, though it was probably no time at all, when the door opened very suddenly. It's me, I said quickly. I was afraid he was going to shut the door in my face. Theodore Decker, the boy says. Remember? Theo is Hobie's one-word answer. All that needs to be said. His hug was strong and parental and so fierce that it made me cry even harder. Then his hand was on my shoulder, a heavy anchoring hand that was security and authority itself. It's wonderful to see you. I wish, very much wish, that we could all sing together right now the old hymns, even if just virtually. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Oh, may your house be my abode and all my work be praise. There would I find a settled rest while others go and come. No more a stranger or a guest, but like a child at home. Going home, going home, I'm just going home. It's not far, just close by. Through an open door, I'm just going home. Softly and tenderly, patiently, Jesus is waiting and watching, waiting and watching for you and for me. And then that lilting chorus, come home, come home, come home. I wish we could sing the hymns together. And soon enough, I'm sure we will. I wish we could sing them together because truly home is where the heart is. And singing together makes us feel part of the whole. A number of you have said to me in conversation on the phone how much you miss being here in the sanctuary because it's your spiritual home. Well, this thing we're doing right now, it's not wholly what we want, but this time together online, experiencing worship together virtually, not the least of which being the hearing or recitation if not exactly the singing of the old hymns, is something. A reminder of what we mean to each other. A reminder of what we long for. Of what we look forward returning to. And a reminder, a glimmer, a foretaste of what we will enjoy someday in that great home of welcome that our Lord Jesus has gone to prepare for us, and that awaits us all. Come home, come home, come home. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Throughout this season of Easter, each Sunday we have been affirming our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, and we will do so again this morning. I ask you to join me as we affirm the faith of the Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We will now, as an act of faith and as an act of gratitude, offer unto God our tithes and our gifts this day. And as we are doing this virtually online, I ask you, as I have in previous Sundays, to, after the, this service is over, to sit down at a table or a desk and write out a check to the church uh, or to a mission agency, if this is not your church, uh, to support the work of Christ's kingdom. Let us give gratefully and let us give sacrificially. Friends, we have sung the doxology together, blessing God for the blessings that he has imparted to us. And now we come before God in a time of prayer, offering up our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers of concern, our, our prayers of deep gratitude and our prayers of intercession and petition for the world. We have heard stories of pain and suffering this week in the, in the news, on television, and elsewhere. We have heard stories of pain and suffering through friends or acquaintances. The family of a little five-year-old girl who died of the coronavirus in Michigan. A 40-year-old man in Damascus riding his motorcycle when somebody pulled out in front of him and he was killed. There are other stories, stories of people that we know in our own congregation. We, of course, want to keep Charlie Asbury and Phil Kennedy and our homebound members in our prayers. We lift up again Kim and David Coffey and the Coffey family upon the loss of their son Will last week. And for others who are very much upon our hearts and, and in our prayers this day, we will have time in our prayers this morning to lift them up. But I ask you now to join me in prayer and at the conclusion of our prayer together, if you are following with the bulletin, uh, you will be able to join me in unison in our closing prayer, which is drawn from the hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. But let us now pray together. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, for the gift of one another, for the gift of family and good friends. We give you th thanks and praise for the presence of your church in our communities 
across the world. And we give you thanks for the promises of Scripture, this dear promise that we have received this morning that, that your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ has gone before us to prepare a place, a place for us, and that He is waiting for us there, waiting and wanting to welcome us home, to our deepest home, our greatest home, our our truest home. Oh God, we give you thanks for opportunities to come alongside people that are in need. We even thank you for the gift of pain and solace, the gift of empathy that we have for those who have suffered loss. It is a gift. A painful one, but it is a gift nonetheless, and we are thankful for it. Oh God, you know all that is going on in our own lives, and you certainly know what is going on in the life of this world right now. We trust and believe that you care and that you are involved in the remedy. And trusting in that and, and having faith in that, we lift up to you all the people who are on the front lines of medical care, confronting the, the virus that has taken so many lives, and, and those who are dealing with other medical situations, other health crises that are going on as well. We give you thanks for all these nurses and doctors and medical technicians and for all the research scientists. And Lord, we give you thanks for people who are making sacrifices in other ways to carry on the avenues of communication and, and sustenance the things that we need, truckers and, and uh, assembly line workers, factory workers, and, and uh, people who work on, uh, on the, the meat chain lines. For all these people, and there are so many, we lift up them to you and give our, our prayers of thanks on their, for their sake, uh, for, for their doing. Now, oh God, we lift up to you our own personal prayers of gratitude. We want to say thank you for the blessings that you have imparted to us or imparted to others for which we, we offer up these thanks to you now in silence. Oh Lord, you call us to pray for the concerns of the world. You know the great need that lies all around us, the growing health crisis, the growing economic crisis. We pray for wisdom, wisdom for our leaders, wisdom for ourselves. We pray for patience. Oh God, Help us to get through this, trusting in your providence and care. We pray for those who are suffering, suffering from all kinds of conditions, but especially right now in, this, in the grip of the pandemic. For those who are in ICUs, or in emergency rooms, fearing for their lives, for those who have lost loved ones, families who have been devastated, and for all the pain that's out there on the economic front. Oh God, give our leaders 
the wisdom to make the hard choices, the hard decisions. Help them to do so not out of political maneuvering, but based upon the best science. Help us to help one another by reaching out to those around us who are shut in. To help reach out to them in ways that we can do by a phone call or coming beside them from outside and waving a friendly hello. Lord, you know the needs of your people, not only here in Tazewell, but across this wide world. We lift all these needs up before you in the name of your son, the great physician. Heal us. Heal our land. Heal our world. Physically. Emotionally. And spiritually. And now, O oh God, we join in prayer, in our closing prayer, drawn from that wonderful hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. And we pray together, God of Grace and God of Glory, on your people pour your power, crown your ancient church's story, bring its bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour, for the facing of this hour. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of your salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage serving whom we adore, serving you whom we adore. Amen. Friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen.